Staying sane when everything feels like it is insane, which is very accurate for right now, but we also have other big stressors that can make things feel that way besides COVID and everything else going on currently. Some of us are a little more blessed with stress this year than others. Um, this does have some slides that you guys might have seen before if you've attended some of our other webinars, but they fit for this. And we have some great staff to put those together. So first off, let's talk a bit about what we do. So this is Blomquist Tales, kind of goals of what we do. We will help you with any life challenge. So we're gonna take the call. If you have something you really need help with, give us a call. If we think that maybe someone else can help you more, we're gonna help you figure out who that is and get you with them. It is totally free. It's covered by your employee benefit. This includes your family, and that includes your children. We're not too strict on who family is. Had a lot of people ask, you know, can I bring my husband? Can I bring my kid? Can I bring my nephew? We're really not that strict. This is for you and your family. It is 100% confidential. We don't share anything with anyone, with the big exceptions of if you're gonna hurt yourself or someone else, then we gotta talk to somebody about keeping you safe. But other than that, 100% confidential. We don't share this information with anybody. We do have phone or video available. I know some of you guys are trying to stay home and work from home, but also sometimes you just don't want to come into a therapy office. So we can do it by phone or video. You're also welcome to come to any of our offices. It's very easy to use. We're always happy to help. We do have a 24 hour crisis line. So if you need you know, to talk to someone at two in the morning, if you need to talk to someone over the weekend, we have that crisis line. There are trained counselors, including myself when it's my turn, who will answer that call. We do have hours most days between nine and nine. We do have Saturday staff, we have evening staff, we have early morning staff, which really depends on what you need. We have a lot of times available. So if you guys do have any questions on that, please do let me know. I'm happy to answer them to the best of my ability. Stress and anxiety. Between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. And that's by Viktor Frankl. And I particularly like this one because it's by Viktor Frankl. Some of you guys might've even heard of him in school or come across him in other avenues. Viktor Frankl is really famous for creating a therapy called logotherapy. It's a therapy that's really good for dealing with life changes, really big ones, not just those small ones, but big ones. I don't usually talk about people who we quote, but in Viktor Frankl's case, I think it's appropriate for this particular um, presentation. Viktor Frankl is a survivor of the Holocaust. Lost his family, um, he did go into a camp himself. He uh, even, someone found on his person, his doctoral work and destroyed it in front of him. He, when he got out, he found he'd lost his mother, his wife, everything. So the reason I say that is this is someone who does know what he's talking about. It's not just someone that read a bunch of books. This is someone that does know what it's like to deal with your world falling apart. And if you ever do want to read his books, he has several of them. Um, you can just look him up, Viktor Frankl. You see his name right there. It's kind of an odd spelling. So what is the new normal? That is a term we're hearing a lot right now. It's a little overused. But it's when we experience a major change, a trauma, a stressor, and things around us are starting to go back to the way they were, or we're getting used to the way things are, but it's still not the same, because we've changed. We've been through this experience, and that's why it's called the new normal. So some people, for example, have returned to work, but still doesn't feel the same as it did back in, say, February or January. That's the new normal when we first lose someone very close to us, we're never gonna feel the same. Even though the world goes on around us, we've changed. That's the new normal and that is a bit of what Viktor Frankl is talking about. That little space where we have control. We choose how we see it. So locus of control is another way of phrasing that and how you kind of look at your control. So if it's an external locus of control, it's kind of like everything's happening to me. We all know someone that's a bit like this. 
The world's just picking on me. It's awful. I don't know what to do. Nothing wrong with that here and there. But if you stay in that, you kind of wallow in it, it's hard to see a way out. Internal locus control is, what can I do? What can I say? No one can make us say or do something we truly don't want to do. So even when the world's falling apart, what can I do? What do I control? I can decide what I say. I can determine what's going to happen next. That's where locus of control comes in. And that little just grasp really helps us stay sane when things are going crazy. Why is it so hard when things go wrong? Well, this is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Some of you guys might have even seen this in a psychology class or a biology class even. The idea is it's a pyramid. If the bottom level is not covered, we can't take care of the next level and the next and the next. So the very bottom is those physiological needs. Breathing, food, water, major injury, our body temperature, blood sugar, being alive. If those things are things we're worried about, I can't even worry about my house, my health, my employment, having enough money to stay afloat. Above that is our friends, our families. It's one of the reasons sometimes if you haven't eaten too well, we might snap at our loved one. Not because we don't care, but our body right now is starving, it's hungry. So all these other things aren't as important, just for that moment. Esteem, so you know, being respected by others, achievements. You need to have all those bottom layers before you can worry about that. Self-actualization, that's that upper level. Most of us don't stay there very long because we get stressors in these lower levels. Self-actualization, morality, creativity, problem solving. Most of us go up and down this pyramid, depending on the day, sometimes all day long, sometimes just over the week. But these are some things to look at when we're really struggling with stress. Where are we at? If we're not doing well with our health, probably really hard to be creative and motivated at work. If we're worried about our family's health, probably really hard to focus on our own esteem and how we're feeling about ourselves. That's Marlo's, Ma Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Oh, I need more coffee this morning, I apologize. So what can I control? Your mindset, your diet, sleep, your self-talk, so that's how you talk to yourself, your character, who you are as a person, your morals. Exercise, your activity on social media, really encourage people to watch that where you spend your energy, how you help others. These are all things in your control. No one can take those things away. There's a little graphic with our fox. Things we can't control. I can't control what other people do. I can't control how long COVID's gonna last. I can't control what my family's gonna do. I can't predict what's gonna happen. So again, that little space. Coping skill types. So these are six of the most common types of coping skills. Distraction, thought challenge, self-love, grounding, accessing your higher self and emotional release. We're gonna go over each of these. Some people have like a favorite. Some people use more than one. I usually recommend if you can have a couple in each, it's a good way to go. So distraction. Most of us know that one. Distraction is something fun to help you not think about what is bothering you. Talk to someone you like. If you don't live with them, call them, text, FaceTime, Zoom, even send a letter. Man, I love getting something in the mail that's not a bill. Play a game like a video game, a board game, charades, a puzzle, trivia. Watch a film or TV show that you like. Read an enjoyable book. Create something new. Draw something. Color something. Do a craft. Build something. Learn something new. How to speak a new language. How to do our origami. How to draw cartoon characters. Take a walk or a hike, travel. Distractions with tangible results do tend to feel better. So tangible would be something where I can see it, touch it, experience it with my senses. So for example, if I'm playing a video game, I don't exactly have something I can see, feel, touch when I win a level. Or even if I'm playing a game on my computer. Whereas if I'm checking things off a list, if I'm completing a crossword, if I'm organizing a cabinet, if I'm building a model, I get to see the results of my hard work. And that sets off in our brain feelings of success and happiness, which helps us cope with stress. It actually does lower some of the stress hormones in our body, like cortisol, adrenaline, those unpleasant ones. 
social media in the news. I know it's a great distraction, but a lot of it is meant to cause a reaction. Reading the news or listening to it on the radio gives you some time to process. So it's a little easier not to get quite as upset. I do recommend avoiding news and social media at least a couple hours before bed so that we don't do that toss and turn over what we heard. Even blocking or muting those posts or people that upset you on social media. I mean, if you really feel like you need to separate from that completely, no problem. But sometimes just even muting that one relative that says things that offend you. It's okay to do that for a month. Might make your social media a little more enjoyable. Check if what you're viewing is causing what we call thought distortions. We're going to go over what those are, but challenging that thinking so that you don't end up kind of wallowing in that upset and feeling of, I have no control. It's a thought challenge. Using your brain to think about a problem in a new way to change how you feel about the problem. Brainstorm ways to fix what is bothering you or make it less upsetting. That's also a way to feel more in control. Think about the problem as something you can fix. If not, what are you in control over? Journal, talk it out with someone, write a list of pros and cons. When thoughts are in your head that are stressful, they kind of spiral. It goes from one thought to the next thought, and we just go around in circles, not getting anywhere. If it's out of your head, written down, talked out. Um, some of the teenagers I work with love to do videos. It's easier to examine it and go, well, okay, as I say that, that doesn't make sense. Or as I write that down, mm, is it really that bad? Is it really something I can fix or not fix? Getting it out of your head is a great way to examine your thoughts and feel more in control of them. What are some of the good things that might happen because of this problem? There's not always a silver lining. Freely admit that. But sometimes there is. Talk to someone you trust about what is upsetting you. It's not gonna necessarily solve it, but even having someone just hear you, having someone validate what you're going through, someone that says, you're right, that sucks, can really help. So critical thinking, thought turnaround. Observe a thought, is it true? How can I know it's true? How do I feel when I think believe this thought? Can I see a reason to drop this thought? Is there something more true? I was just talking to someone this morning. We get this weird idea that how much we worry about a problem impacts the outcome. And in truth, it does not. I could worry about a problem all day. What's gonna happen is gonna happen. No one's gonna go, hmm, you know, but she worried about it for at least 12 hours. Let's cut her a break. She doesn't work that way. But we get convinced if I worry enough, mistakes won't happen, bad things won't happen. Not true. Distorted thinking patterns or ANTS. ANTS stands for automatic negative thoughts. So that'd be black and white, all or nothing thinking. Always, never, you know, not seeing that green zone. Catastrophizing. So it's the worst thing ever, it's the end of the world. One of the things I see this a lot of is when we're running late. All of a sudden we are, we need to go, 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 forget your shoes, go, 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 go. What really is gonna happen if we're Wait. Most of the time, it's not life or death. It might be bad. You might have to, you know, miss part of a movie or pay a fee for being late or reschedule an appointment. Most of the time, it's not end of the world. It just feels that way at that moment. Mind reading. We assume what other people are fe feeling, thinking, what they even feel and think about us. Oop, I think I see two questions in there. Are those ones related to what we're or Corona, I've actually never had that bounce up in the middle of one of these. Yep, so I just answered it. So someone asked if these slides will be available later tonight, and they will. So when I send the recording tomorrow, I'll send these slides in PDF form, so you'll get them. Awesome, good question. Um, personalizing, so it's easy to personalize. If a friend doesn't call you back, you may assume she must be mad at me. This is one I talk about with teens a lot. Their friend didn't talk to them today, and they assume my friend's mad at me that we're not friends anymore. Man, we don't know. It could be all kinds of things. Maybe your friend wasn't noticing you. Maybe your friend's having some stressors. But it's easy to do when we're stressed, to really decide it has to do with us. Jumping to conclusions, you know, we assume without checking the evidence. Same example, you know. Why is that friend not paying attention to me? Um, another one that's maybe a little more adult, boss says, hey, I need to talk to you after your shift. 
man, our brains tend to go to the worst place. We're already, by the time we get there, I'm going to be fired. I'm in trouble. I'm this. I'm going to tell them that they can't fire me. I'm going to tell them not to get me in trouble. Who knows? They could be there to talk to you about, hey, you want to join this team to help with morale? Hey, I wanted to thank you for what you did yesterday. But our brain likes to go to that awful thing so we can get ready for it. But challenge that. Is it really that that's going on? Do we have evidence that that's going on? Filtering out the positive. That's what we just thought about. You know, we're not paying attention to what could be. Deciding they don't count. Especially if we're really mad, we'll reject some of those positive things. Shoulds. We should be this way or this should happen. Could is a better way to look at it. Perfectionism. We believe mistakes are bad. In truth, none of us like people that are perfect. We're very suspicious of them. Don't shoot for perfect, shoot for real. If you're not making mistakes, you're not trying hard enough. Everyone makes mistakes. I don't care who you are, what your job is, how smart you are, how talented you are. We all make mistakes. And they're some of the biggest learning experiences you can have. We don't change things when everything's going right. Labels, so instead of focusing on behaviors, we make blanket statements. I'm such an idiot. People are so selfish. The world's awful. I have a grandfather that particularly, anytime he watches Fox News, oh, the labels, so many labels. Reasoning from our emotions. We believe that because we feel a certain way, it indicates the truth about a situation, ebb and flow. So that's kind of that, when our emotions get really out of control, they do that up and down. And that's also where we can get really stressed because our feelings are all over the place. Or when someone describes that feeling of, I don't even know what I'm feeling. We're basing too much of our feelings on emotion and not what we're thinking. How we move from fear to logic. Why fear? Brains are wired for survival. That is part of our amygdala, our fight or flight system. Become self-aware. Validate yourself. It's okay to feel fear and anxiety. So, for example, we were talking earlier about boss says he needs to talk to you. Our brain's getting ready. It's getting ready for what awful thing could happen. But recognize that that's what it is. It's your brain getting you ready if something bad happens. Doesn't mean that we need to turn fight or flight on. Fight or flight is specifically for that life or death. I'm going to punch something. I'm going to run away for something. I'm not going to assume any of your guys' work environments, but I'm assuming running away from your boss or punching is not going to work. So really questioning that, taking that deep breath, because you do not need to turn on fight or flight for something like that. Close your eyes, take five breaths. Yep, think of three things you're grateful for. Not everyone likes that. Um, another one that I do a lot of is what are three things that you got to look forward to today? What are three things you have control over in this moment? What are three things that you have that are valuable? Not everyone likes the gratitude ones, but they are popular for a reason. Engage the rational part of your brain. When you're thinking about things like, what am I grateful for? What's going right for me? That's an indication to your brain that fight or flight is not present. Because if there was a bear, a fire, an earthquake, odds are you and I would not be spending time thinking about, hmm, I'm so looking forward to seeing my family after I get home. I, I'm so excited to see that movie this weekend. We wouldn't be thinking that if we're getting ready to run. It's a way to help your brain kind of loosen that grip. What can you do to deal with, with that issue? It depends if it's triggered, if something's very specific. So like if it's that boss thing, what can you do to deal with it right now? Could you ask your boss, can I ask you what we need to talk about? It might help you prepare for it. Critical thinking, so thinking patterns. When we modify our thoughts, we actually do change our brain. So all these things we were just talking about, when we work on those, it becomes a new habit. So instead of our brain going straight to panic, it starts going through those steps of well, what is actually going on? What do I actually know? What can I do about it? It does take practice to make it a habit. All y'all, I assume, at some point had to learn to read or write. Maybe both, I hope. You had to learn every letter, every sound it makes. What sound it makes with the next letter? You learned that years ago. I'm assuming now that when you read a sentence, you don't go, hmm, is that a longie or a shorty? It's just there. You don't need to think about it. 
but that took practice again and again and again. Driving, there was a time we were all new to it. There was a time when we first drove on the freeway. For a lot of us, once we've done it for a while, we just hop right in and go. But it took that practice. It took doing it over and over again. It's the same with this. The more you practice, the more it'll become easy. Self-love. Oh, I meant to fix this. I got all kinds of messed up. So these are all ways to kind of take care of yourself and remind yourself of your own value. Everyone's a little different. There are some people out there who do not like manicures, pedicures, that don't like popcorn. But doing something nice for yourself. One, it helps you kind of fill up your bucket for the day to handle the stress. Two, it reminds you that you're a valuable person. Sometimes we need that after a rough day or before a rough day. Kind of depends on your preference. These are just some ideas. But doing something nice for you. Grounding. So that's using one or all your five senses to feel safe, calm, happy. So grounding is kind of a pause button when we're stressed. So we talked a little earlier, if I see a bear and I'm actually thinking through things, that's an indication that there's no bear. If there is an actual bear, I'm gonna respond very quickly. So if it's just a stressor, doing things to indicate that it's not bear, it's not a fire, it's not an earthquake. So it could be any of your senses, it could be all of your senses. A very popular one that we use with kids is find five. What are five things you see, four things you can touch, three things you hear, two things you can smell, and one thing that you can taste. And that can be done in any order, but it reminds you of where you are right now. Anxiety always has you 12, 20 steps ahead because it's getting ready. It's getting ready for that dangerous thing. Grounding is a way to loosen that grip so that the anxiety loosens and you feel calm and able to take the next step of thinking it through, breathing exercises, whatever works for you to calm down. So that's what it's for, it's that pause button. So looking at pictures of things that cause you to feel happy, safe, calm, pictures of friends, the ocean, animals, funny memes, draw your own picture, if you're artistic. Um, listen to your favorite music. Listen to someone you like to talk to and focus on their voice. Listen to a comedian, play soothing sounds like a rainstorm. Smell your favorite smell, scented markers, crayons, pencils. Smell your favorite foods, perfume, scented hand sanitizer, lotion, bake some cookies. In all honesty, most of you can get away with it. No one's gonna notice. If you have a favorite smell, have it on your hand sanitizer and just rub it into your hands and focus on that smell. And that can really help you go, okay, it's not life or death, I got this. Eat some of your favorite foods or treats. Taste your favorite taste in the gum or mint. A lot of the kids I work with love uh, Pop Rocks and Warheads. Some of us adults like those too. But mints, gum, some that just you find soothing that you can focus on. That reminds you, you're safe. You got this. Play with a pet. Fidget with a keychain or necklace. Rub lotion on your hands. Drink something hot or cold. Take a warm or cool shower. Temperature is one of the fastest responses that goes back to that Maslow's hierarchy needs we talked about. If my body temp is off, my body's very aware. But if I'm taking a hot or cold shower, that's a signal to my body that's not life or death. And it gives me back control so that I can think. So this is the part of your brain, the amygdala that we talked about, that kicks off that fight or flight. And you can see it right there. It is the little, unfortunately I don't have a little laser, it's the little one that's kind of red and glowing towards the middle of the brain. And that is that stress response. Its job is to flood the body with cortisol, which is a stress hormone, and adrenaline so that you can run, you can plan, you can get away. Again, useful in an emergency. Not so useful if it's not an emergency. So it's the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic. One of the things to watch for is when that clicks, when that turns on, there's usually a physical response in your body. People are a little different. For me, it's a stiff neck and I'm clenching my jaw. Some people get sweaty hands. Some people start fidgeting more. Some people will stick to their stomach. Some people feel the heart going faster, faster, faster. When you notice those, that's an indication that it's not just stress. This is fight or flight kicking in. 
And wow, we need to do something to signal to the body to turn that off unless we need it. So if you get really good at cueing your body and going, whoa, I got a stiff neck. Oh, maybe I'm, oh, maybe I'm a little more stressed than I thought. Maybe it's fight or flight. That's a good time to use a coping skill to feel calm. That is a time to step away from an argument or a meeting. Because you might say something that's motivated by fear and not what you'd need to say. So that goes into mindfulness. You guys might have heard this before. It's about being in the present moment. Grounding is a way to be mindful. It's being focused on what's going on right in front of you. What do you feel? What do you see? Because again, anxiety is 20 steps ahead. You want to reel it back to where you are right now. So focusing on the facts is one way to do it, but also focusing on something in your head. It doesn't have to be something you see in front of you. A very common one with mindfulness is safe place. Closing your eyes, trying to breathe as normally as you can to get that heart rate down, and picturing some place that makes you feel safe. It can be a made up place, it can be a real place. Mine is the left bench at Disneyland in front of the train station. What do I see, what do I smell? Popcorn, people, that lovely Disney tune from Sleeping Beauty, and it makes you feel calm, safe. It could be any place. It could be any image. Some people picture their family, some picture the ocean. But by doing that, it's a signal to your body, it's a signal to your brain. It's not life or death. Give me back control. It does not make the anxiety go away. Even if I gave you all the strongest drugs on the planet, it would not turn that off because that is such an important part of the body. Even people unconscious have stress anxiety responses. That's why they sometimes check someone who's unconscious by poking them, and sometimes the body will even respond. That's an indication of a coma or something else. Part of that is that response is so important to keep us safe. So you can't turn it off. It's there to keep you safe. What you can do is put it in the back seat and you in the driver's seat, and that's what this is for. So fight, flight, freeze, those are what we've been talking about. What does your body do? Learn to recognize what your body specifically does. You might be like me, clenching your jaw, stiff neck. You might be talking faster. You might be twitching a little more. You might be one of the people that has a sick stomach. Learn to recognize what your body does, and it'll help you gain more control and awareness when that's going on. Having that control back can really help with your stress. So meditation practice, I'm not gonna make you guys do this, but 30 minutes a day has been shown to reduce the size of the amygdala. So the amygdala does grow a little bit if you're more stressed. There's a book called The Body Keeps the Score. Very good book, a little dry, but a good book about how the body is physically changed by stress and trauma. One of those changes is the amygdala does get bigger and more active. So we do know that meditation actually helps with that. There are free meditations on YouTube. There is just simple breathing and counting in one, two, three, hold one, two, three, out one, two, three. There's walking meditations. There's guided meditations. It really depends on what your preference is. I know not everyone's a meditation person, but adapt it to work for you. Giving yourself that calm, that focus on what's right here, right now, and focusing your breathing is really all that's required. Even doing something like reading or drawing, if you're mindful, can be good meditation. So temperature, intense exercise, pace breathing, paired muscle reaction. These are some things that help with stress and anxiety. We talked a little bit about some of these. It does depend on your preferences a bit. Temperature's kind of an obvious one. Cold temperatures actually help your body calm down. It's the reason we actually sleep better if it's cool. But it does depend on your preference. Some people, if I, you know, give them some cool drinks, ice, or a nice pack, oh, they can't handle it. Or some people, it's a way to activate that in your body. So even just a cool cloth on your neck, an ice pack, Drinking cool water. You don't want it cold. That's going to trigger something else. But cool can really help activate. 
Um, some of my clients, when we're super stressed, will get a Slurpee or an ice cube just because it really triggers that calm down. Again, cool, not cold. <laughs> Intense exercise. So when we exercise, it actually produces endorphins. So dopamine, norepinephrine, which I always mispronounce, serotonin, vitamin D, but also oxycodone. These are all hormones and they're released when we do intense exercise. And you can feel it in your body. Not everyone's into intense exercise, but it really does help. It also lowers that adrenaline that comes with that fight or flight response. And it can make it easier to kind of go, okay, let me think. Whereas if we still have that adrenaline in our body, we're trying to sit still and think, man, hard to sit still, we get twitchy, we get bouncy in our seat, we can't think we gotta do something now. Where if we get that exercise done, we get that adrenaline down, easier to think. Again, all within reason, please don't necessarily go run a marathon if that's not your thing. Really good for agitated, angry, anxious, when you can't get the thoughts to stop. Again, depends on the person. You're probably not gonna find me doing a lot of intense exercise. It's not my thing, but for some people, it's great. Pace breathing, so you guys kind of heard me do a little bit of that earlier. It's just kind of pacing out in. One, two, three, hold, one, two, three, out, one, two, three. You really want it to be deep breaths that cause your belly to move. So with kids, I call it belly breaths. I have them actually put their hands on their belly to feel it move. But doing that naturally lowers your heart rate, calms the breathing, and signals to your brain, we're safe. We got this. Do adjust as needed. I can do about three seconds on each of those. I'm an asthmatic, but I know people that can do five, 10 seconds. And man, good for them. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> but just doing that, just that pace measured breathing can really help. If you're having trouble doing the pace breathing, use a grounding technique to give yourself a pause button and loosen that grip. Then it becomes easier to do. Paired muscle relaxation. So what it is, is it's tensing certain muscle groups and releasing them. And it actually signals our body a release of stress. So that could be clenching your fist as hard as you can. Count, I usually do 10 seconds myself. Release. You can do it in all kinds of ways. Some people do it with some stretches. Some people I even know will tense their toes and kind of curl them up and do it that way. It's very discreet. But it's a way to clench, release, it lowers the stress, it gives you some hormones to help you feel safe. We're not gonna practice. <laughs> That's more for when we're in a live environment. A little bit more on that. Again, it's not obvious to others, people aren't gonna notice. And the one thing I would caution is if you're tensing a fist, be a little careful when you're doing that just because if someone can see a fist, sometimes they take it as aggression. So if you are gonna do a fist, I would recommend doing it under a table or something where no one feels threatened. Emotional release, that's another one of our coping skill types. So emotional release is one of my personal favorites. It's expressing your emotions in a healthy, safe way. Sometimes you just gotta get it out of your body. There's a lot of adrenaline and energy associated with our feelings. And sometimes they just gotta get out. Crying, yelling. Again, not at people, don't scream at people. But it gets it out. Exercise, running, throwing a ball against the wall, punching a punching bag, breaking up a piece of papers, breaking something that's okay to break. Personally, I, after a really bad day, will sometimes go to the thrift store, the dollar store, buy some breakables, and I'll take them home and I'll break them. As long as I'm not throwing them at other people's property, as long as I'm not hurting anybody, it's an okay thing to do. And man, sometimes you just wanna see something break. There's even smash houses in Utah where you can go, you can pay some money, they'll charge you by the pound, they'll give you a bunch of glass objects, a bat, some safety gear, and you get go to town, and they'll clean it up. Good gig. Singing, listening to loud, angry music, finding something funny and laughing a lot, expressing how upset you are to someone to listen, but not in a way that's mean to listener. It's okay to vent. Just be careful when you're venting that you don't take it out in the person. Again, as long as you're following the rules and the laws and no one gets in hurt and trouble, it's okay to do. Some of my clients, we've even scheduled our releases. 
especially if they have a really heavy work day. We have, I don't know, a half hour before work starts where they get a cry, scream, be as upset they want, and once it's out, okay. We're putting back on our mask of we're calm and safe at work and doing what we gotta do. A lot of us are on stage all day long. We have to be calm, cool, collected with our coworkers, our clients, our customers. Sometimes we need a space to release that and just scream. Yeah, as long as you're doing it safely, not a bad thing to do. And if you need to schedule it, schedule it. You don't have a screaming break. It's okay to do. Oh, missed one. Drawing out your feelings, especially feelings through art. That's a great one. Again, I'm not particularly artistic myself, so it's not something I do a lot of, but if it works for you, it's a great thing to do. Accessing your higher self. So that coping skill is about helping others, doing something that helps other people feel happy, makes us feel like we're fixing something even if we can't fix a bigger problem. And it really depends on you as for what's gonna be meaningful. Call or talk to someone who's feeling lonely, send a letter, an email, video, or package. Again, I love getting things in the mail that aren't a bill. I'm sure you guys do too. Bring some food to the food bank or needed supplies to the homeless shelter. So this is a thank you card to someone who's helping you or is helping the world. I was reading an article just last week about instead of doing gratitude lists, do a thank you card once a week to anybody, to your coworker, to the cashier at your favorite restaurant. It does help to feel like you're helping somebody, especially if you feel like you can't solve your own problem. Ask your local church charity workplace if they know someone that needs help. Most of our community churches are desperate for someone to offer. Leave something nice to the mailman or a colleague. You know, just leaving a favorite candy on someone's desk, wow, makes someone's whole day. Send a note to a local nursing home. Some of them miss their family and friends right now. Do a random act of kindness. Just randomly cover the bill of the so someone behind you in the drive-thru. Leave some flowers for somebody you don't know. Join a cause, participate in a fundraiser. Those are things that bring out our passion. It also helps us make feel the world's not as bad as it feels right now. When you can see other people doing good things, when you're a part of doing those good things, the world doesn't feel so hopeless. Connect with sources of inspiration and or spirituality. Those can be really wonderful things, again, to feel like the world isn't an awful place. It can be a place to kind of release verbally or mentally some of our stresses. Varies from person to person. And it could be inspiration like painting, it could be Go attending church. It could be just being part of a cause that causes you inspiration or feel spiritual to you. It can really just help feel like there's hope, there's value, there's something that I'm part of. Support system. So good boundaries between work and home. If you're thinking about work when you're at home, you are working for free. Do not recommend. No job deserves that. Keeping your work environment as safe to as comfortable as possible, again, within reason. If you can, have your workplace be a place where you feel safe, comfortable, welcome. I know there's some things you can't control. Most of us don't have workplace where we can wear pajamas. It'd be nice, but no. Nope. But have it feel comfortable, safe. If you need like a picture of your family that you even, if you share a desk, just bring with you every day and sit at your desk to look at while you're there. If you really need, you know, a scent that helps you. Again, follow your work policies. I wouldn't want you bringing something in that's gonna hurt anybody, especially people with allergies. But you know, put some lotion on your hand and just enjoy the smell. Have a favorite candy that you keep in your drawer. Your coworkers will love it too. Have those things to make you feel safe. Have access to your coping skills at work. If you need a space where you can scream, what's a space you can do that at work? If your music really helps you feel centered, feel safe, have some headphones so that you can do that at work. Keep connected with your social supports and hobbies. Work's great, but no matter how good your job is, someday, someday we're all gonna retire. You need to have things outside of work or what is there to look forward to? We're not just our jobs. <laughs> Our jobs are important, they're a huge part of our identity, but we're so much more than that. When we don't have things outside of work, man, it does feel just yuck. So build something if you don't have something. Connect with people, connect with hobbies. Have a solid routine. It really throws off your day if you don't have one. 
Sometimes we don't have control of our schedules, granted, but really have a solid routine. After work, I do this. Before work, I do this. Have something to look forward to and get out of bed for every day. It can't be work. I'm sorry. That's not going to motivate you to get out of bed. But something that you can look forward to. It's going to help you have a reason to get up. Because when things feel crappy, if you don't have a reason to get out of bed, man, we would just stay there all day. I would. Having little things you can appreciate every day. Even if it's a snack that you bring with you to work, if it's you know, being able to talk with your son or daughter, maybe it's just that the weather was nice or that you heard a good song on the radio. Have just little things, they do add up. Having goals and something you are working towards. I don't necessarily mean big lofty goals or work goals, but what are some things you wanna accomplish? Even if something small like, I want to see what the bottom of the sink looks like. I'm going to get the dishes done. Or I'm going to get at least these three things done today. I'm going to spend time with my spouse and we're going to have a good time. It makes you feel like you're accomplishing something. We all need that. Having tangible results for your work. Most of our jobs are computer-based these days. And if they're people-based, odds are when the people are doing well, you don't see them. You might only see them when they're not doing so hot. And so it can feel like, am I really doing anything meaningful? Am I really getting anywhere? So have tangible results for your work when possible. And that could be a goal, like I am gonna be friendly to every customer that comes in. It could be a goal like when so-and-so comes in, I am still gonna be calm, cool, collected, even when they scream. It could be a checklist. It can take something that's not tangible, make it feel tangible. Look at all the things I checked off today. It's going to help you feel like you're getting somewhere. Thank you all for attending this. I really appreciate y'all coming out. So many people. I really hope it was helpful to you. So questions, comments, anything at so, all that you guys want to ask? No questions have come in yet. So real quick, if you guys have any questions, just unmute yourself or send it in chat and I'll ask it for you. Um, and while we wait for those, let me just reiterate that we are glad you guys are here. Um, and I will be sending out this recording and the PowerPoint PDF hopefully later today, if not um, tomorrow morning. Um, and let's see, we do have another workshop. We have a workshop scheduled pretty much weekly. Um, the next one is next Wednesday and that one is titled, let's see, Thinking Airs 101 and it's Carol presenting that one. So. That one is an option for next week. I'm just finishing up the flyer for it. So it'll be up online, the same place you registered for this one in like, give me five minutes and it'll be up there and you can go ahead and register. Okay, so just a few things have come in. A lot of people are saying thank you, very helpful. Um, someone said, what did ANTS stand for again? Automatic negative thoughts. Okay. So if you Google it, you'll get a bunch of pictures of little ants because that's what we usually use with kids. I like it because I'm a very big kid. Um, so it helps me visualize it. So we call it, you know, the black and white ant, the future telling ant, and that one looks a bit like a future teller. Okay, so a lot of people are just saying thank you so much. This is the one of the best they've been to. They needed this today, so. You should feel good getting off here, Elizabeth. People, good. I'm glad. You. We really did want to get this out to people. It's been a rough year, but we're going to get there. Yes. Okay. And another question you mentioned cool, not cold. What do you mean by that? So drink cold water. So part of the trick with temperature is you do want to cause a response in your body. So with cool and cold, you don't want it so cold that it triggers a stress response. So for example, if I'm outside and it's cool, that feels pleasant and it's easier to think. If I feel cold and I'm shivering, then that's gonna stimulate a stress response because my body's now worried about survival. So that's part of the trick. Um, so say like an ice cube's usually just cool, not cold. But I had someone that said they love to walk into the walk-in freezer at work. And that one I worry about more. Because if you're there for more than a few seconds, a few minutes, your body's gonna start going, So that's kind of what I mean by cool, not cold. You don't want it so cold that your body starts shivering and worrying about safety. Okay, and then someone said, what's your favorite angry music to listen to? 
Ooh, <laughs> Twisted Sister. <laughs> <laughs> I remember one uh, December years ago when I worked in Alaska still, uh, there was a small craft warning that came in after we were already on the water. One of the most stressful three hours of my life. And I swear the only thing that got me through it was listening to the Twisted Sister Christmas album. Nothing <laughs> like Twisted Sister screaming silver bells got me through that because wow. <laughs> That's awesome. And other people were responding to that question. Someone said angry music, 80s screamer rock music. Yes, good stuff. Okay. Hair so bands. Said, yeah. If someone said heavy metal, some ACDC, it varies a little bit. Everyone has their favorite kind of angry music. Right. <laughs> okay. So this one is if someone is in constant fight or flight and their coping mechanism is to blame others, how do you help them move to a logical brain and recognize their own thinking errors? So part of the trick right then when they're in fight or flight is everything at that point's a threat. So if you've ever been in a fight with your spouse, you could even say, okay, you're right. I agree. That's what we're going to do. And they don't stop. They're still lashing out. That's because that fight or flight response is kicked in. And they are at that point fighting for survival, not necessarily to kill or punch you, but their brain's still fighting for survival. So what to do in that moment is to help them use a coping skill to feel safe. It really depends on each individual situation, what's the safest thing. Sometimes they need space, sometimes they need you closer. But really coaching them on how to turn that off. Because if they're in that mode, everything feels like a threat. And if they're calm, it's an easier way to talk to them about, hey, what's this going on? What can I do to help you when you're feeling that way? Do you need me to back off? Do you need me to get closer? Do you need me to get you a cool drink? It depends on the person. Do you need a warm drink? But that is what I'd usually recommend. If that person is specifically in fight or flight at that moment, saying calm down is the last thing you want to do. You really kind of want to help them feel safe physically. And that will help them turn that off. Does that kind of answer the question, I hope? Yeah, I think so. Um, and then the next one is, when I use coping me mechanisms like clenching or listening to angry music, it seems to amplify the emotion. How do mm -hmm. I get another, in parentheses, better coping mechanism? What criteria do I look for for um, instant calm down? So probably in that one, you'd want to use some grounding techniques. There's nothing wrong with, you know, enjoying that anger. But if you want to actually turn it off, you probably want to get that adrenaline down. So that could be doing some sort of exercise or something that actually gets the adrenaline down. It could be using something like a cool temperature, um, a candy that has a strong taste smell, something that gives you that feeling of safety. Now, if you're feeling that really strong anger and it's just not going anywhere, you probably need to get it out. And so probably the clenching of the fists, the listening to angry music is not getting it out. So writing it out, talking it out, screaming it out, find that safe place to do it, running it out even. It's going to lower that adrenaline and help your brain release that grip. Okay, that's good. And then the last one that we have so far is, what was your ways of coping with the windstorms we just had? That was stressful on many levels. Um, our office didn't have internet for a week, so I, I was doing a lot of trying to figure out how we were going to see people. Um, the windstorm itself didn't scare me as much because I'd been through so many in Alaska. Um, what I did was I turned up my white noise machine. I got my cats near me so I could see that they were safe. And I kind of shot a text to my family members to make sure they were safe. And that was kind of what I needed in that moment. And that is my big advice when you're facing something like an earthquake or something that actually does feel threatening. When storms are like that, what can you do to feel safe in that moment? You can't just tell your brain, it's just a windstorm. It's just a lightning storm. It's just an earthquake. Your brain's going to go, uh-uh, uh-uh, deadly thing. So doing what you can to feel safe in that moment until the danger has passed. And so if that really means, you know, you're going to hunker down somewhere in your house and feel safe, okay. That is okay. I don't want you to necessarily do something that's going to hurt yourself or someone else. But that is what I really recommend. And so for me, it was making sure that everyone I was worried about was safe and kind of drowning out the sound. It does vary a little bit from person to person on what works best with making you feel secure. Okay, 
This one is, any tips on how to stay willing to return to a stressful situation on a daily basis? An example would be family interaction. Yes. So one, before the family interaction, if you know it's coming, do something to kind of prep yourself. You know, take yourself out for a nice meal. Talk it out with the other people you're going with on, okay, we're staying for half an hour, or we're staying until Uncle Ralph brings up politics. And once that happens, you need to make excuses and leave, depending on your family. So there's that prep. When you're there, give yourself some grace and boundaries. I don't have to worry about Uncle Ralph's feelings if I say, hey, I really don't wanna talk about, pick your political topic, any topic. Or I'm gonna sit with so-and-so, so I don't have to sit with so-and-so. So doing what things you can to stay in control in the situation. Um, one of the things I do a lot of is when I'm in a stressful situation and I have someone that's annoying me, especially if I met them before, I do tally marks on a piece of paper. Sometimes I'll even do it with somebody. And so it'll be a competition of who can get great, great grandpa to talk about the communists the most. Because I actually do have a great grandpa that does that at family events. You know, how many times is so-and-so at church going to be off pitch? How many times is this girl in my class going to bring up her previously published work? And so just little tally marks. And if it's with somebody, I do a competition who can get the most, whoever gets the most wins, the other person buys a drink, dinner, ice cream. But sometimes it's just a way for me to turn that from a stressor to a game. Don't show the person the tally marks, make an excuse that they're asking what you're doing. But that's a way to feel in control in that situation. And afterwards, do something to reward yourself for doing that and recover. Boundaries are really great, but I know that sometimes you can't set firm boundaries with family or can't get out of a situation. Boundaries are a good one, but those are the things I recommend besides those. I like that one a lot. <laughs> I never do tally marks on you, I promise. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so this one said, let's see, someone made a comment. Someone said, Smash Labs is great, and I also recycle glass. Throwing it in the bin and hearing the smashing sound is very ther therapeutic. Oh, yes, and there are some ugly ceramics at the thrift store that just need to go. Some of those mugs. We all have too many mugs. All right, that's all that we've got. So, um, oh, someone did mention in some areas <laughs> that smashed glass can't be recycled. So just make sure you know what's allowed in your area before you go Absolutely. smashing. But that doesn't. Um, if you feel creative, take that smashed glass and turn it to mosaic afterwards. Right. If you don't, pulverize it. All right, that's all we've got. So. Um, Oh, someone just said, someone sent me this. My 11 year old is finally feeling safe. And I think after the earth, my 11 year old is finally feeling safe. I think after the earthquake and COVID. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. It's tough being a kid, especially because they do feel really helpless. And with kids, when I do these presentations, I talk to them a lot about what they can control. You know, helping them come up with a safety plan for the house if there is an earthquake. Talking about what they can do for others, what they can do for the situation. Right. As a kid, it's really easy to feel helpless. And I do want to remind everyone that um, these workshops are awesome, but if you need a little more one-on-one -on -one or um, extra advice, feel free to schedule an appointment. So most of you, probably 98% of you have our benefits. So um, feel free to give us a call and we can get you scheduled. And if you have kids, we have therapists that specialize working with kids. Elizabeth is one of them. She's great with kids. So we love kids. Um, love, love. Yep. So feel free to give us a call. And if you don't want to call, you want me to call you, I can call you. So just send me an email, respond to the email I sent and just say, Hey, I want to schedule an appointment and I can call you and we can talk through a little bit about what's going on. So I can pair you up with somebody and make sure you have a great experience. So, um, and my Absolutely. Email, Heather, and we also have resources if you guys are just looking for some of those. Yeah. Yeah. There's a ton and we're always here to help. So no matter what you're going through, just know that we've got you guys, we've got you covered. So um, I will send out this recording, like I said, hopefully later today, if not in the morning. So watch for that. And um, like I said, I'll get the workshop up for next week. So you guys can register for it if you'd like. So I hope you guys have a great rest of your week and we will see you later.